uh, fishing implements in a house in Bethesda. Now you might say, well, why is that important? It's showing that the Gospels are historically accurate when they talk about the culture. Minor details that are mentioned in the Gospels, if they're confirmed in history, shows you that there's an intricacy there that you cannot get by fiction. In John chapter 2, verse 1 and 11, they found uh, storage uh, storage where uh, storage pots just like you see in the story uh, in Canaan in John chapter 2 verse 1 and 11 Pool of Bethesda John describes it as near um, near the sheep gate the discovery of the pool shows beyond doubt John was right Tiberius John is the John identified the Sea of Galilee as the Sea of Tiberius getting the exact kind of language of that time in John 6 1 John 21 1 he got Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea in 4 BC AD 39, moved his house, as it were, his capital from Sephorus to Tiberius in AD 24. So John gets the political times right very clearly. The Gospels talk about Pontius Pilate. We find an inscription about that. We, The Gospels talk about Jesus going to the temple to discuss we find the very stairways where people taught and sat at the temple to discuss. We found a Galilean boat in Luke 5, 1 to 11, uh, archaeologically. And we even found maybe Peter's house in Mark 9, 1. Ron Wallard writes, almost all scholars now espouse this view. So I could go on and on and on. Uh, if you if you read Craig Blomberg's um, book on um, the atrocity of the Gospels, um, you will find time after time after time the Gospels get it right historically. I've tried. I've gone into depth on the Quirinius census. Uh, by the way, if you want to look at that, if you look at my videos on Jesus, uh, uh, Cambridge Companion to Jesus. But the point is that um, there's countless facts verified in the Gospels, historical facts, and minor details that people who are making things up wouldn't get correct. And there has to be an acknowledgement that there is historical accuracy within the Gospels. Now, there has been an unbalance, an, in, an injustice and an imbalance concerning the Gospels. Since Paul, a lot of biblical scholarship and historical Jesus studies was influenced by post-enlightenment thinking and was anti-church and so believed that it should get behind the Gospels and get to the true source material and it was to ignore the church's perspective on the Gospels. But what that did is it began to take apart intricately analyzing every bit and part of the Gospels, never accepting any of it as historically accurate. Now, because of the 1920s, when uh, Jew Jewish scholars wrote the lives of Jesus from a Jewish perspective, and that scholarship was discovered in the 1950s and 60s, it began to dawn on scholars that Rudolf Bultmann and the form critics were actually not correct in their assessment of the Gospels. Bultmann assessed that the Gospels were actually, uh, that the, he, he believed 
big Greek culture and that anything that was Jewish was not historically accurate. But because of the revival of Jewish scholarship in the 50s and 60s, scholars realized Boltman and the form critics were wrong that there was actually a Jewish context to the Gospels. What that did then, it made scholars realize there was actually more historical content within the Gospels than was given credence. My argument and, and contention against atheists and skeptics who would say that we look at the Gospels piecemeal, that is the historical method, and that we look at every individual bit and assess it on its merits, is not completely fair because we wouldn't do that with completely with ancient historians. There will be some ancient historians are generally accurate and will take large chunks of what they're saying as accurate because we know that they would generally go and investigate and they would generally be be fair with their sources. We might be spot various biases, we might be able to spot indiscretion or compromises or whatever, but we'll have a general trust of an author or not. And I think the injustice with the Gospels is since the Enlightenment, there was an utter radical skepticism. And I think that, pendul that, that legacy is with us today, and I think it has to change. I think there has to be a much more readiness to accept from the skeptics and from academics that the Gospels are generally trustworthy in their historical information. And if that's the case, it means you should be much more open to the data that is given about Jesus' miracles and about the resurrection. So it's a case of do you take a skeptical position or do you take a more of innocent till proven guilty? And I think the fair option in looking at the gospel documents is to say innocent till proven guilty rather than the radical skepticism that many skeptics use it's just a, a complete unfairness to the fact that we are finding continually the gospels as being accurate historically that's a very important point a nuanced point in this debate on did Jesus rise from the dead It is true to say that we look at detailed historical data on their own terms, but it is also true to say that there are some writers that we know are more trustworthy than others. And so the question has to be up, as we look at the detailed information, are these writers trustworthy or not? That has to be answered, and the skeptics quickly put that under the carpet and don't put it up for debate. Because if they did, if the evidence goes one way, it means it's the end of the debate for the skeptic. Now, if we look at the Gnostic Gospels, we can compare the difference between the four Gospels. And we can find that when the Gospels mention, um, for example, in contrast, we find the Gnostic texts do not anchor Jesus in historical time. For example, Pilate is not mentioned at all. Galilee comes only once in the Gnostic text. As for biblical gospels, Pilate appears about 60 times. And I could go on and on and on about more information about that. So the Gnostic gospels show that they have no real historical integrity whatsoever. Then finally, we find that the gospels are rooted.